In every classroom up and down the country, in every home, no matter how big or small, and in every family, rich or poor, one in 10 children under the age of 16 is struggling to fit in. It's like having two children in one. Whether the issues are behavioral, emotional, or clinical. <laughs> I realised that, oh my gosh, I'm being sick like 10 times a day. <laughs> the whole family's life just got blown out of the water. Whatever their condition, more than half of these vulnerable kids will go undiagnosed. On the referral, they'd written selective mute. At the age of 14, I felt like I was throwing my life away. Are we bad parents? Yeah. Have we done this wrong? Bye. We followed a number of families as they embarked on a journey to understand their child's behaviour. You just feel so helpless. and mm. nothing you can do. No. And through therapy... And that if it was my kid, I would want her to be on medication. ..learn to cope with what having a child who is different really means. Sometimes you just think, well... What did I do wrong? How come they got the perfect child? And that's a horrible feeling. It does make you feel like such a nasty person. <laughs> Even in the idyllic affluent suburbs of Bramhall near Manchester, things aren't always as perfect as they seem. People don't have problems in Bramall. They don't even divorce. They don't argue. The only problem in Bramall is that your tyre goes on your new Aston Martin. <laughs> There's only me with a child with mental health problems. Ten-year-old Adam is not like other boys his age. Since he was a baby, Charlotte has known there was something different about her eldest son's behaviour. Yeah! 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 particularly towards his younger brother, Sam. We had a side-by-side -side buggy when Sam was born, and Adam used to attack him, so we had to buy a front and back one. And he used to attack children in Valley Nursery, and he was like three. The children had come out from the cloakroom with scratches and claw marks, bite marks, and there was nothing they could do. I like the football. I don't like doing, going to school. I like having lunch there. Eat it! Over the last eight years, there have been dozens of assessments, but Adam's parents have still yet to get a diagnosis. He's got speech and language issues. He's got behavioral issues. He's got autistic spectrum traits. He's got strange tics. He's got what they call magpie syndrome, where he takes things. So none of that fits into a nice little package. So they all say he's an anomaly, or he, we don't know, sorry. I've been in doctor's surgeries in Bramall when Adam's kicked off, and I've had people tut at me. I've had people say to me, I'm in here for a headache, you know. If he had one of those leather helmets on where children bang the heads, then, yeah, people would think, oh, bless her, I hope she's managing all right, I hope she's coping. But without a formal diagnosis for what is wrong with Adam, Charlotte has no option but to send him to a mainstream school where he struggles to communicate and so expresses himself through anger and regressive behaviour. <coughs> Baby noises happen every single day, up to 50 times a day on a bad day, 10 times a day on a good day. For any reason, he could be in a good mood, bad mood, angry, cross, happy, sad. He also started recently sucking his fingers and his thumbs, and that's another sign of him regressing into a place where he felt no responsibility and no anger to speak of. Just any stresses and any problems and any worries weren't his, they were mine. And the baby noises are him being back in that place. Adam's dad works away a lot, but luckily Charlotte's parents live close by to offer support. I think he feels mostly secure around family. 
he isn't under any pressure to behave, to be normal. Oh, gorgeous! I think he struggles with understanding himself. One of the hardest things I find to uh, deal with is the noises that he makes and the 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 the, the faces that he he will pull. I think um, why that's hardest is because that's when he doesn't look normal. Mm. That's when it's yeah. like somebody smacking you in the face and saying he isn't normal. I get looks like, well, for God's sake, I'm sure your daddy could pay for it. And yeah, we probably could, but what? What could we pay for? What? You can't pay for him to have an operation that's going to give him normal life. But Adam's Adam and we just love him to bits. <laughs> Next week, Charlotte is taking Adam to see a child and adolescent psychiatrist in a last-ditched attempt to get some answers. Do you know why we have to go and see these doctors? Because I'm poorly. Why? What's poorly? Cross. You get cross, don't you? Yeah. Who do you get cross at? Don't put your fingers in there. Oh! <laughs> Tickly. Yeah, you know, you've got grass all over your face now. I love him. What makes you angry? Um, people. People? Yeah. Love you. Love you too. That was me on, during the gig and I was... A year ago, 16-year-old Henry was at a party, playing a gig with his band. And this is literally minutes before. When an unexpected event changed his life. It was at my house, and um, it was my dad's birthday. And the lights flashed, and he just kind of... It was quite odd, cos he, he, he sat down and he suddenly went very pale. So that was quite scary. I didn't pass out, but I just went, like, numb all over. They first thought it was epilepsy, and then he started doing all these weird things. Henry was having a severe fit, as many as 150 separate ticks in a minute. The tick attack, that, the really big one that he suffered, certainly came out of the blue as far as I was concerned. And then he, he kind yeah, of got sort of a bit more violent. jolted his head back. His whole body was moving. He was just jerking. He couldn't control his arms, his legs, his head. Uh, his pupils were dilated, he had cold, clammy skin. And it, then it kind of got into, like, the vocal tics and stuff. Yeah. Quite scary. And then you start asking some questions, you know, have you taken any drugs? The answer to all those questions was no. <sighs> I mean, that was a day when our lives changed. The whole family's life just got blown out of the water. Well, there is a load in the morning. Henry was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. I wished it had been a brain tumour because at least they can zap it and cut it out. Tourette's is a neurological condition said to affect one in every 100 school children, although not every case is as severe as Henry's. Every day was just really upside down at that point. You don't know whether you're coming or you're going. It is characterised by multiple physical tics and at least one vocal tic. On average, every five seconds, Henry's body moves uncontrollably. You feel like a mental build-up in your head, like a headache, just pulsing in your head. And so when you finally release the tic, it just sort of drain, drains it out of your head, out of your mouth, out of your head, out of your arm. At every family get-together, Tourette's is always the uninvited guest. <laughs> Henry is one of 10% of Tourette's sufferers who also has coprolalia, or uncontrollable swearing. These words are often racially abusive, but are not a reflection on the sufferer's thoughts or views. You disgust me. Who does? <laughs> it's a tick. How am I supposed to know? Involuntary action, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> Well, give us an involuntary opinion, then. You've been tango! Henry's school friends have stood by him, despite the heavy cocktail of drugs he needs to control his symptoms. The drugs that he's on, 
sometimes cause him to almost have like mood swings so he can get a real extreme like ex extreme. annoyed argumentative or extremely happy and laughy like yeah. he, won't. And he, he won't be able to stop and he won't be able to like stop himself yeah he'll thing. be in fits so, for but as a person hours. i don't think his personality has changed in any way at all really yeah. which is good Tourette's couldn't have come at a worse time in Henry's life. His GCSEs are approaching and his studying is not going well. A year ago, before Tourette's, I was uh, on target for A's all through. But now I'm just aiming for a C in all subjects. Because I've just been ticking all over the place. And my concentration's gone down and um, can't really focus on anything or take stuff in. Most 16-year-olds struggle with what to wear for a night out or what to spend their birthday money on. For Henry, however, he is faced with the dilemma of slowing his mental processes with drugs or living with constant, violent tics. Sometimes, though, you just feel like, oh, just somebody fucking kill me. Not, like, literally kill me, but uh, it's like, just get rid of it. To any parent, six-year-old Catherine is an ordinary, lively, talkative child. Hey, I've got big ears. Hello, I've got big ears. She's a fun-loving girl who loves things that are pink. She loves her dolls. She likes to be nice, nicely dressed. Um, and she loves playing with her friends. Catherine lives with mum and dad and four-year-old sister Evie. If you saw her at home, you wouldn't think that she had any problems. If you saw her at school, you would see a totally different six-year-old girl to the one that you see at home. It's like having two children in one. And every morning, Catherine's emotional state changes and she becomes a different child. My car. <laughs> it's got a very fat lunch bag. That's why. She's perfectly normal. She chats to you and then you, you're going to drop her at school or at nursery, and then you see her become anxious, so, so her body language displays anxiety. She gets what I call the symptoms of fight or flight. She'll become tense, she'll get tighter all over, so it's almost as if she's closing her body in. Come on in, Miss Bruzy. Come on, Mrs Hooligan. That's right. Do you want to run ahead, Catherine? No. You're right. Good. Catherine's been going to school every day for two years, but each morning is as daunting as the first. Since the day she started school, she's never spoken a word. Line up five. are learning to solve a problem. I haven't ever heard Catherine speak out loud in the class or in a small group. The most she has done is in sm a small group, she kind of laughs out loud and will like make noises if she's playing a game and things like that, but not, not actually speaking out loud in the whole class, no. Do we think we understand? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Give me a smile if you understand. When Catherine was two and a half, uh, we became aware that she wasn't communicating the way other boys and girls were of her age. We didn't know at that time it was a condition. We just thought, again, it was part of the shyness. But what I am going to do is I'm going to... But this is more than a fear of school. Because she wasn't talking, Catherine was referred to an educational psychologist. On the referral, they'd written selective mute. It felt like a label. It first of all felt like somebody's made that up and that's their best way of explaining what's wrong with Catherine. But I didn't like it. I didn't like the term selective mute. Selective mutism is a communication disorder in which a person, most often a child, who is normally capable of speech, is unable to speak in given situations. Selective mutism often coexists with shyness or severe social anxiety.
one in a thousand children shut down like Catherine in social situations. It's not that she refuses to speak in public, she simply can't. Catherine was once at school and was ill. She vomited on herself at the dinner table. She couldn't tell anybody that she felt ill. Being trapped in her silent world at school, Catherine is unable to verbally express how she feels or what she wants. It's heartbreaking to see her want to do things and not being able to do them. If Catherine doesn't have any intervention and she still doesn't speak at school or in a social situation, it would drastically affect her in adulthood. When she's a young woman, what's she going to do? So I need to get something in place, whatever it is, and we both feel this. I think this is what well, it's a necessity. Nigger country, fucked it, wang bollocks. I'm gonna fucking batter you out, son. While Catherine struggles to find the words to express herself, Henry cannot stop himself uh, from saying things he has no control over. You fucking get it. Tourette's is incurable, and it's the electrical impulses misfiring in his brain that are responsible for his uncontrollable motor and vocal function. The headbanging taste has told me all muscles come red raw. Oh, there we go. Um, it's just easy, because uh, we, we often have headbanging competitions with, with my mates, so it can last the longest and I, I, I always win. He's been on medication to reduce the tics. But with his brain feeling like it's in a fog, he's made the brave decision to stop taking the tablets in the hope he can study for his GCSEs. Uh, since I stopped taking medication, I um, just generally felt more happier, more lively. Uh, you just do generally feel better for not being drugged all the time. But with the drugs consigned to the dustbin, the ticks are back on the increase. So mum Emma is turning to alternative therapy. And when Henry's back gets really bad, all he's got to do is say the word, mum, I need a massage. <laughs> Emma is a Reiki master and massage therapist. The ticks come out of that swearing a bit more, swearing sentences, um, head banging, and just the head twitching, really. He said, I love the feeling that my brain is alive. I am alive. I'm alert, I'm not drugged. Yeah. The fact that he's exhausted everybody around him. <laughs> 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 Reiki is an energy. It's not a human energy. Mm -hmm. It's an, uh, an energy mm. of the universe, oh. if you like. Mm. Since Henry's been diagnosed with Tourette's, the different alternative therapies we have tried has been a bionutritionist, my massage and reiki, an acupuncturist, the osteopath, the homeopath, and a regressional holistic therapist. Do you mind touching my head? Sorry. <laughs> but it was the osteopath who made a startling discovery about Henry's condition. Every time she came round to the back of his head to do some cranial work, there we go. I don't know if you caught that. He was mm. he started to tip very violently. Ah. <sighs> Fuck off! <laughs> Love you too, darling. <laughs> As Henry was about to discover, his oversensitive jaw may be the key to helping alleviate his tics. It's every parent's hope that they'll give birth to a healthy, perfect child. But since he was just a few months old, Charlotte knew that Adam was different from her friend's children. I did nothing wrong. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, nothing wrong. I was healthy. And sometimes you just think, well, oh, how come they got the perfect child? And that's a horrible feeling. It does make you feel like such a nasty person, too. Because you're almost wishing that they hadn't. Adam has been prone to aggressive behaviour for all his young life and Charlotte fears for what this means for the future. Nobody listens to me, and they never have. I just know that unless we can get him the help now, he will be in jail. Many young offenders have mental health disorders, which have often gone undiagnosed. Adam isn't just a cross little boy. He's not a little boy with an angry nature, that's not him. 
Convinced that there is a clinical reason for Adam's behavior, Charlotte is preparing for yet another mental health assessment. But feeling let down by the system over the last eight years, she's less than optimistic. I feel a bit, oh, there's another two hours of me answering the same questions, I'm telling the same thing, and then I'll get a letter repeating everything I've said in the assessment, and it'll say at the bottom, we don't know. Every time it's something that Adam has to go through again that he doesn't understand. So I'm hoping this one's going to be different, but we'll have to wait and see. They've come to the Priory Hospital, Cheadle Royal, a specialist inpatient service for children and adolescents, to meet with consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Pfizer Khan. Do you want to come with me? Come, Charlotte. The most important aspect of child psychiatry is observation and non-verbal communication. OK, tell me about your school now. Hmm. I'm just, you know, there's one, one question which I want to ask you, yeah? Do you think you're different than other kids? Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. You tell Dr. Khan. Yeah, I think it will be important. Does it bother you that you're different? Does it sometimes? Hmm. How does it make you feel? Sad. Sad. And what do you do when you're sad, Adam? Mm. Do you want Mum to tell? Mm. You don't ever say when you're sad, do you? So what do you do when you're sad? Cry. Cry? Yeah? Mum, does he cry? You only, he only ever cries when he's hurt, and that has to be seriously hurt. He, mm. he, you don't cry, really, do you? At all. He never has. Sometimes it's help with words. Because they're not in the bank. I know. Adam is struggling to engage with the process. In order for Dr. Khan to come to a conclusive result, she needs to carry out more tests. So for now, Charlotte will have to wait another two weeks for her long awaited diagnosis. My favourite food is tuna. Because it's got salt in. Six-year-old Catherine suffers from selective mutism. I live from a day as a girl because I don't talk. One day I would like to talk at school. When do you think that day will be? Don't know. Despite being told she'll eventually grow out of it, after two years of silence at school, her parents have decided to take a more proactive approach. So today, Catherine is meeting Michelle, a speech and language therapist. Although Michelle is a complete stranger, it soon becomes clear that Catherine has no problems talking out loud, as long as she's in her own home. Already? You're quick! <laughs> It does go right at the bottom, you're right. Uh, there's a teddy on the seesaw. Yeah. And loads of teddies. Do you? So the next day, Michelle meets Catherine in school to go through the same play therapy as she did at home to compare her reactions. To go in first. Her body language had completely changed just on meeting her. So that's why I offered to hold her hand because I think it's quite nerve-wracking walking into a room. It's an underwater puzzle. Yes, there's a boat. Back in her school environment, Catherine is reluctant to speak. Whoa! <laughs> she was pointing to different pictures to say that, that she'd noticed something. It goes in the middle, doesn't it? Do you watch Ariel, the mermaid? Disney mermaids, yeah. A lot of her anxiety is related to mm. in the environment, mm. the school environment, and that's that's part of the condition, that's mm. nothing to do with the school, no. that's part no, of her diagnosis. No. So, should we put him over there? That's brilliant. I'm not going to make you talk, 
I'm just going to make everything nice so when you're ready and feel happy and comfortable, you can. After 40 minutes with Michelle, Catherine is starting to gain in confidence and beginning to whisper. 18. 18? Wow! What she knew that I was going to accept her non-verbal communication and her sounds, she was far more relaxed. And it's reducing that anxiety that is the biggest pressure for her. Over the next few months, Michelle will work with Catherine to help her overcome her anxieties so that one day she can find her voice in front of her fellow classmates. To overcome her anxiety at school about speaking, six-year-old Catherine relies on sign language. It was initially developed for Down syndrome children, but obviously it's brilliant for Catherine as well because it's a way that she knows she can communicate with, with other people. These emotional issues are so ingrained that Michelle, the speech and language therapist, will be working with her three times a week. We don't know wh which way she will go today. Um, it's obviously only the second time we've been in the school environment together. She might talk, but the most important thing is to reassure her that we're not going to make her talk. Mum, Sarah, has come along to help with the therapy session. Hi, can I have Catherine, please? Catherine is taken out of her large classroom to go to a smaller, more intimate and quiet space Just to make her feel I'm safe. Some games in their little room. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave you and Mummy playing some games and then while you're playing I'll just nip in and put it on the table. Can you remember how to play it? Brilliant. Thank okay. you. See you Have in a fun. bit. Mummy. Yeah? Oh look, he's eating a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, see. Oh look, he's... Oh, look. That's the mummy seal. There's the mummy seal. Look, I just let her build up her confidence and keep talking with mum. Ah, that's that bit. This is the first time Catherine's spoken in school, so this is a big step for Catherine. Ooh, look. It is indeed a big step, but the real test will be whether Catherine continues to talk out loud once Michelle enters the room. Found the dragon game. Ah, fantastic. Where does that piece go, Catherine? Not that. Ah, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. What? You were about to say not there. I was going to say not there, wasn't I? <laughs> really? <laughs> what if you push it down? I'm going to see if you can make Mum jump. I'm going to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Mummy can't do this very well. I've just got to nip to the loo. Is that OK if I go and I'll be back in one minute? Is that all right? Oh, oh look. Baby bubbles. They're baby bubbles. They're lovely. Wasn't they great? <laughs> I know it's only one thing that she's done, but it's a massive thing that she's done, and if she can do that in one step, what else can she achieve? Success. Catherine spoke out loud in school for the first time. But the real challenge will come when she leaves the comfort of the small room and faces her own classroom, complete with 30 noisy children. As they await their next doctor's appointment, Adam's family have come away for the weekend. He hasn't got to wake up and put his school uniform, which immediately changes his mood because he knows he's going to school. He's not really into routine. And the less people here, the better because it doesn't, it doesn't like people around us. This is Adam. This is how Adam would be. Just hearing him laugh. Because sometimes he goes through really long periods where he doesn't laugh. And you think, well, what are you thinking? He'd pay a million pounds to spend half a day inside his head just to see what he's thinking. You, you can't be happy unless your child's happy. I mean, I'm supposed to be able to read my child like a book. I'm supposed to pick up on facial expressions, but sometimes there isn't anything. There's nothing behind his eyes sometimes. He's staring, but he's not, you don't know if he's thinking or what he's thinking. And you want to just go in and take whatever it is out and put a load of happiness in. Following her discovery that Henry's particularly sensitive to massage around his neck and jawline, 
Mum's made contact with a dentist, who offers a pioneering new treatment for Tourette sufferers in the UK. It's very new. It's not particularly liked by the neurologists, but anything's worth a try. Well, this one seems to make the most sense, uh, but I'm not too sure about it. This is Henry's third visit to Dr. Andre Hedger, and so far has cost Emma over £10,000. Hello. Hi. Hello, Henry. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Nice to see you. Hi, Hi. Nice Hi. to see you. When he started 44... Henry's been wearing a brace to create a space between his jaw and skull. Dr. Hedger hopes this will relieve the pressure on the nerves that create the spasms. What happens in a Tourette's pace is that the lower jaw is, is pushed too far back. It's not in the correct place. So what we're doing, quite simply, is making the upper jaw wider and more forwards. And by releasing the jaw joint, we stop pressure squashing the nerves that's making his brain fire in the strange way that it does in Tourette's. That's the eyes, the shoulders, the flicking, and the barking, and the coughing, or spitting, or swearing. And it's that simple. Open my clicking there, did you hear that yep. click? I don't think we had that at the start. No. That's really good sign. No. Open wide. The sign of, of the clicking opening means that the jaw joint is unravelling. Yeah. One of the things we're going to do is just measure how wide you can open. So give us your maximum, please. Wide as possible. Mm -hmm. 51 millimetres. Wow! And he started at 44. Yes. He'll be like, making more yeah. noise soon. Yeah. <laughs> so to make it wider, we're just going to Widen this a little bit, yeah. right? Fuck five. And then that will be you, happy bunny. After three months, the brace has yet to improve Henry's yeah, symptoms. But it remains his only real hope to help reduce his tics. Back at home, the family is relaxing. But Tourette's is never far from their minds. It's just Tourette's, tick, good day, bad day, phone the school, phone the doctor, phone the therapist. Yeah, it's, it's constant. It's day in, day out. You don't wake up without Tourette's. Having seen him going through it for the last 12 months is a bit shocking. But I love him and he's my brother. And you just got to deal with the fact that he's got Tourette's. Oh, my <laughs> God! <laughs> I'm very proud of Henry because people around him having a totally different view of him. You know, to adapt to that is just... It's amazing. As much as Henry tries to adapt, he's not always in the party mood. Fancy trying it again? Oh. <laughs> no. The hot tub actually tends to... The hot tub actually to... flicks you off, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it did, well, it's been a long time since you've given it another go, but... Oh. It's all right. Hey, Aaron. Bye. Bye. Surprise. Why have you thought he would join us? To be fair, he, he has so much to deal with. Can you imagine the energy it takes to deal with his life from the minute he wakes up to the minute he goes to bed. I can't imagine that. Who knows what makes Tourette sufferers tick? Two weeks since their first visit, Adam and his mum are back at the Priory to meet with Dr Pfizer Khan and her team. Today, they're going to do a series of tests which will evaluate his levels of engagement and interaction. I'll do that. Understood? We'll start with something very, very easy. What I want you to do is fit these to this design, whichever way you like. And you can ask me more. If this task more is to thought. evaluate Adam's logical thought processes. Hey, hey well done. Now, Dr. Khan wants to see how Adam yeah. illustrates his imagination, giving him an example of a story using five random items. And he thought it was too hot. So then he went, oh, so he went to get some ice cream and then came back and sat under the umbrella. Yeah? So it's your chance to pick five things out of this. So what's happening now? Bouncing. Bouncing on the... Huh? Planet. Planet, yeah. After working with Adam for two hours, Dr. Khan and her colleague confer on their findings. 
We have gone through the clinical history yeah. and we have done the ADOS assessment and uh, the diagnosis for Adam, clinical diagnosis is autism. He did not use any imagination. He was using the objects as they were, quite yeah. literally. And like the car was car, it was bouncing over a, you know, I've uh, done that with him. planet. I've done that with him for years. I used to get silly things like uh, the inside tube of a toilet roll and draw wings on it and let's play a plane and he'd look at me, me as if to say, that's not a plane, it's a toilet roll. <laughs> he gets frustrated and angry very easily because he doesn't understand the feelings of others or anything, you know, which is reciprocal in terms of interaction. Yeah. I don't Good. know how you feel about it. I, it's the first time somebody's actually sat there in front of me and said, yes, I think it is autistic yeah. spectrum disorder. Years ago, when it first started, I got told, he can't be autistic because he's good in school. And, and how is he with routine? Also, well, he doesn't really like routine. We can't be autistic then. Do you know what I mean? It was like, if he doesn't tick that box, then it's not that. Yeah. I, I stand by with my clinical judgment on that. After eight long years, Charlotte has finally got her diagnosis. Absolutely. My best day since I started worrying about him. Hey, yeah, brilliant. Want to just cry and scream and hug her and uh, nearly kiss her. Autism is a spectrum ranging from very severe end, severely autistic, to high functioning with no speech and language problems, which is Asperger's. So in Adam's case, actually, the differentiation is that he's not Asperger's, which would have been high functioning. His needs are more like a child with autism. To have this diagnosis makes a significant difference. First of all, for Adam to understand that he has some impairments. So it's not that, that he, it's his fault. Secondly, for the parents, that they're not just bad parents, or it's not that they have done something wrong. It helps everybody to understand him in a better way. Actually, I think it's as much about I've been heard and, and Adam's been heard. He's a fantastic boy. And it's just going to get better and better and better and better, isn't it? It's been a month since Catherine started working with Michelle, the speech and language therapist, to combat her anxieties about speaking in school. Today, Michelle wants to really challenge Catherine. We're changing the environment, so we're moving from our safe base and we're going into the empty classroom. Whilst her classmates are away, Catherine will be encouraged to firstly interact with just her support teacher and best friend, Emma and then see what happens when the rest of the class come back from break. <laughs> she's laughing, she's laughing. Today, Mum is not taking an active part in the therapy, but is observing in the hope she catches a glimpse of her daughter speaking. I'm just here because I want to know how it goes today. This is a massive step, it's a big day, um, and I'm, I'm a mum, I just, I just want to be here and see what happens. It does come on, it does normally come off like this. It doesn't matter, because you still have a lid on. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the green monkeys have to go in the pool. Yeah. Just put it in. I'm really, really pleased for Catherine. It's a big, big move in a really positive direction. And get some monkeys. I'll show you. And then put them on. How many monkeys? Mm -hmm. And you can hold hands. That's it. That's yeah, we'll keep those I would like back. Catherine to be able to do the things she wants to do and not feel as though something is holding her back. And I think just having a bit of confidence in her ability will make her ability better. Are you going to put it over there? OK. Oh, well done. Wow, she's got it. Go. She's got it on with a hand. Do the listening. Oh, can I have one yellow gorilla? A monkey, please. Uh, <laughs> it's time for break time. Can you find a yellow one?
you want to put it away? Catherine, do you want to put it away? You need to find your clothes and then you can come with me and we'll go and get you changed, ready for school. When they came back from break, mm. she did stop talking, though, yeah. when yes. they all came in and they all wanted to see what the game was and what it was like and what they were doing and what they had to do. Good morning, Miss Macdermott. You probably can't say when it, when it will happen. It's just in Catherine's time on how Catherine feels about the next step. Yeah. and the next step after that, and the next step after that. And, and I feel like I need to help her focus on what that next step is, yes. and just that next step. Yeah. So let's see who's going to come and choose to the first person. Just so that you know, Catherine has definitely started doing more talking at school. She's been talking in the playground, and she's been talking in the corridor. And she said to me that she's happy talking at school now. She seems as though she's realising that it doesn't cause anything bad to happen. Right, mini drum roll. She's come a long way in a short time, and with continued support from Michelle, Catherine will expand the number of children she can talk to. We need to increase those friends. Yes. So she needs to maybe identify someone else that she could play with. So maybe I could help by asking her to think who would she like? Yeah. 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 Ideally, we need four. OK. Thomas. That's the person that she is, but she also knows that She's the only one like that in her class. I don't know how long she's going to accept that for. At what point is she going to say to us, what did you do to help me? Yeah, when, is she going, <laughs> when is she going to say that? Like selective mutism, there's no quick fix for Tourette's. It's been four months since Henry's brace was fitted, and it's not yet stopped the ticking. Before he had the Tourette's, he was fit, he was slimmer, he had a couple of girls interested, I think. His brain was very sharp. He was an A-star student. Life was going his way. And he got really cross uh, for a couple of weeks, um, to the point, actually, I was quite worried. Occasionally, I just hit a low. I was just sitting on my bed, just thinking, oh, why, why has it just happened? Why, why, is, it, why is it doing this to me? I've given up looking for like, relationships since I got to it's just mainly because it's just so hard. Could stop tomorrow, could stop in like 20 years, could stop for never, so, yeah. We've never said Henry will be cured of it. And I do think that Henry will have a tick of some sort throughout his adult life, um, as particularly at times maybe of anxiety or stress. Thankfully, music is the one thing that does relieve some of the ticking. And tonight, Henry's band is topping the bill at a Tourette's fundraiser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best man is a nigger. <laughs> Tourette's is the best man I can fucking get. <laughs> you get it, you get it. I'm really rude. <laughs> Hang on. Ow, my head. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Music is a big help because it just keeps me ticks down, just keeps me happy. It's what I like doing. So it just keeps me a bit, a bit more sane in life, in my crazy life. <laughs> and it's a bit odd, but I just couldn't imagine my life without ticks anymore. Oh, yeah! And my tick and make people laugh. Definitely a bit of a special person, but I'm just a normal, casual guy. <laughs> Sometimes I go to school and say, oh, new day, new day, ticking, oh, great. But most of the time it's just like, oh, happy. Yeah, oh, I just love it. When I look at Henry now, I am hugely proud. He has gotten over so much in a year. He says, people can laugh with me, not at me. And I think with that attitude, there's not many people laugh at him. <laughs> Feels like the battle's over, but we know that tomorrow morning he'll wake up and he's still got Tourette's. But tonight, that feels fantastic. 